بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سار على منهجه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الشيخ رحمه الله شيخ محمد إبن عبد الوهاب الله مرسي بحان الصوه he says وهذا دينه لا خير إلا ما دل الأمة عليه ولا شر إلا حذرها منه والخير الذي دلها عليه التوحيد وجميع ما يحبه الله ويرضاه he says وهذا دينه يعني the first two principles and the beginning of the third principle ها الأصلين الأولين وأول الأصل الثالث the first two principles and the very beginning of the third principle everything that the Sheikh previously explained and expounded upon with the Dalil is Deenuhu, his Deen. Okay? And from what Muhammad ﷺ did regarding conveying this Deen, delivering this Deen, is that he taught his Ummah about everything that it needed and everything that it could possibly want and desire with regards to good and positivity. Good and positivity. Spiritual and worldly. Whether it's specific and explicit or whether it is general and inexplicit. The Prophet Sallallahu he taught us about the general goodness of this world and of the next. The Tawheed of Allah being the first and the last, the most important, the most significant, being the main anchor. Okay? And he also taught us about anything else from the deen that was good and wholesome, specifically and generally. The Salah, specifically and generally. Fasting, specifically and generally. He told us how to fast, when to fast. He told us about food and drink. He told us about the belly. He told us about greed and desire. Any year, any country, any place, the process of him, he gave us the principles to survive. And not only to survive, but to excel. Specifically and generally. And this is very important that we continue to place emphasis on this. Because there's technology, there's advancement in medicine and science and uh, warfare. And all of these things. The Prophet, he taught us about whatever we need in general and specifically. He So, therefore, the most important thing that he told his Ummah about specifically and generally was Tawheed. And the greatest vice and the biggest harm, the greatest worry, the biggest fear, uh, the most formidable cancer that the Prophet warned his Ummah against specifically and generally was Shirk. Okay? He then says, And don't think, O oh, you student of knowledge, O oh, you seeker, O oh, you general Muslim, that the only thing that's important in Islam is Tawheed and Shirk. Don't think that. That that's it. The only class that you want to give, the only khutbah that you give, the only books that you read, and that's, that's, that's your religion. No. He says, And everything that Allah loves, and everything that Allah is pleased with, of statements, of actions, physical, Spiritual, attitudes, dispositions, foods, drinks, politics, marriage, divorce, how you sleep, how you eat, everything that Allah loves and Allah is pleased with. And how do you know these things unless you have knowledge? Unless you seek and learn the necessary knowledge. So Islam is an entire and complete way of life. It's an entire and complete way of life. And if that's the case, then obviously for the Prophet to have come, over a thousand years ago from the Arabian Peninsula, then no one in their right mind is going to say that there aren't things that need to be modernized and things that need to be understood and applied in a different light. That's just common sense. But never ever the core issues and never ever the core principles and never ever the specifics of the legislation that are explicitly laid down. So the core principles, first and foremost, Tawheed and Shirk. Just because you're in Canada in 2018 does not change that. al wala wal bara Okay? Self-control. The Prophet system says don't become angry. Whether you're in a car, a train, walking, in the desert, in the mountains, in the snow, in the space station, in the satellite. La taqdab. That doesn't change. Having good akhlaq. Having bravery. Being honest. None of these things change. Thievery. Stealing. Making zina. These things don't change. They always remain. But... Does it mean that in 2018 in Canada, if you use the restroom, you believe yourself that you have to use three stones? Did the Prophet ever intend for us to use three stones 
or were stones the things which were available, which were accessible in those times? Did the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, did uh, he restrict you to use the tooth stick from the tree? Or is it haram for you to use a toothbrush? The point is that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, there are things which are specific, there are things which are general. There are things which are uh, to his time and his location. And there are things which are universal and things which are modernized. And this is where the confusion comes in. Remaining ancient, becoming modern. Is it true? Is there a balance? Is there a time? Or is it absolute? The problem comes in extremism. The problem comes in lack of balance. And the problem comes in, huh? Not having a proper understanding of what's meant. The Prophet ﷺ wants you to use the restroom and clean yourself with any matter that you can, as long as it isn't something which is sacred and holy, and as long as it isn't something which has a specific usage for it, whatever the thing may be, whether it's tissue or whether it's a rock. But the Prophet ﷺ never ever wants you to become modernized in which you lose your values of spirituality, in which you become a friend of the kuffar, and you love the kuffar and fear the kuffar, in which the Muslim loses his warrior spirit, in which the Muslim loses his idea of this hayatul dunya, of luxury, of technology, of what the Muslims have, it's still hayatul dunya and it's going to end and it's going to, it's going to come to an end and it doesn't mean anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point is there has to be a balance, there has to be proper knowledge, there has to be proper fiqh, there has to be proper application. What's important is Muhammad Wasallam told the Muslims everything that they need to know, generally and specifically, that which is specifically mentioned remains specific. And that which is generally laid down is going to be something that it can be modernized and applied to the time and to the place and to the situation. The time, the place, and the situation. And obviously there are going to be issues in which the people of knowledge agree upon. And there are going to be many issues in which they differ. In which it could go more than one way. And there could be a delil and there could be a way of understanding the delil in more than one way. There are times in which there is a necessity. It's a must. We have to do this because we live in Toronto, Ontario in 2018. We don't have an option except to do this. And then that doesn't apply to Ottawa. The Muslims don't have that problem in Ottawa, so they don't have to do with that and deal with that. And it's wrong to apply the situation of Toronto to, to Ottawa. Wahakada. Men yuride lahu bihi khayran yufaqihu fiddin. Whoever Allah wants good for, he gives them understanding of the religion. What is agreed upon? What is this delayed for? Independent, ikhtilaf, modern, ancient. You stick to this principle. This has to change. This is adjusted. The Prophet said something. He spoke to us in a universal terminology. Wahakada. You can't understand these things unless you have the proper fiqh of the deen. He then says, Wa sharru lidi hadharaha minhu shirku wa jami'u ma yakrahu Allah wa ya'bahu. He says, And the evil that the Prophet said warned his ummah from is shirk. And everything that Allah hates and that Allah refuses, as we just explained, the most important thing, the most, the most dangerous vice was shirk. But it does not mean that that's the only thing that's haram in Islam and the only thing that we talk about and speak about and warn from, as many people do, and we see that they fall into error, both spiritual and physical error. Nor do we take the religion as our convenience. When it's convenient to talk about shirk and ignore and neglect the other things, that's what we do. We don't do this. He says everything that Allah hates of statements, of actions, of dispositions, both general and specific. Both general and specific. He says, بَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَى النَّاسِ كَافَةً Allah sent Muhammad Wasallam to an-nas, all of nas. Does that just mean min? Or does it also include al-jinn as well? Some of the people now say that the word nas includes jinn. And some say it's specific to men, but there's other texts that prove that the jinn are also uh, a part of the audience of Muhammad Wasallam's da'wah, his intended audience. So some of the people of knowledge, they say that the word nas comes from anos, which is kathir al haraka Something that moves a lot. Jinn, like men. Or you say al uns, al istinas, for a person to seek closeness, to seek warmth, to seek friendship, to seek the company of a thing. 
Okay, and that's how the jinn live as well. They live in communities. They have groups and families, tribes and clans, as well as the people of knowledge say. What's important is, we have text in the Kitab and Sunnah to show that the jinn are mukallafun. Okay, that the jinn are held responsible for their deeds, just like the human beings are. And Muhammad Sallallahu was sent to them as well. As Allah Azza wa told us in chapter 46, Surah Al-Aqaf. And he also explained to us in Surah Al-Jinn. The jinn heard the Qur'an and they went back to their people and they warned their people. So whether this word Nas includes the jinn or not, we have Dalil stating that the jinn are from the audience of Muhammad Sallallahu Dawah. That's clear. Bidinillahi ta'ala. As far as the linguistical meaning of the word Nas and its generality, then that is the issue mentioned by some of the people of knowledge. Another issue is, will the jinn go to Jannah? Will they go to paradise or not? We know that they will be saved from the fire of hell. As it says in the Quran, Yujirkum says he will save you okay, from a painful punishment. But will they go to the Jannah? The apparent view, the view that seems to be most correct is that they will go to Jannah just like the human beings. That's the issue of discussion in itself. Moving forward. The author says, وَفْتَرَضَ طَاعَتَهُ عَلَى جِمِئِ الثَّقَلَيْنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ And the obedience of Muhammad والسلام, is mandatory. Was made incumbent upon all of the thaqalain. The men and the jinn. Mankind and jinni. As we were just explaining. Um, what دَلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And the proof of what I've just said is the Qur'an al-Kareem. Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Muhammad was commanded to say, to make an address, to cry out to his audience, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا I am Allah's messenger to each and every one of you. So the fundamental teachings of Islam is that Islam is not for a race or a sex or an age or a class. But for anyone that's included in the word nas. Tayyip. Uh, and the delil from, or the way, the way of understanding this delil from the Quran is that from the duties of the Messenger is to be obeyed. As Allah says, And the only reason why we sent the messengers, Allah says, we haven't sent the messenger except for him to be obeyed by the permission of Allah. Because one may ask the question, how is the messenger's duty to be obeyed? And we all know that a messenger does nothing but deliver a message. He delivers a message. The mailman brings you your parcel. What does it look like? What's inside? That's not the mailman's job. Does he have to like the mailman and look at the mailman? That's not his job. He brings you something. But this messenger is a bit different. And an interesting fact is that there's not one verse in the Quran that instructs us only to obey Allah. Allah never ever says, not once. Just to obey him. We have ayat in which Allah says to fear him, to repent to him. Repent to Allah, fear Allah, put your trust in Allah, love Allah, call upon Allah, call your Lord. But we never ever find an ayat in which it says, Well, I'll tell Allah, and that's it. Just obey Allah. It never says that. Rather, every time the word obedience is mentioned, Muhammad, وسلم, the Rasul, the Prophet is always mentioned as well. Allah always says, and his messenger. Rather, we have ayat in the Quran in which the messenger is mentioned. He's ordered the, he orders the people to obey him, and that's it. Huh? That's it. Huh? So, this is very, very, very interesting Quranic analysis. A very interesting point for any Muslim to show you the importance of the Sunnah uh, to the faqih. The one who studies a madhab or teaches a madhab, a very interesting point. Okay? Um, to someone who's a hadith rejecter, a modernist, whatever the case may be. Very, very, very interesting point here. We don't have enough time to go deeper than that on that point. He says, And not only did Allah Azza wa send him with a message, but he perfected the religion with Muhammad Sallallahu by dispatching him and sending him. What he sent him with, he perfected the deen. What did he do? Ali, Oma, Akmal, Tulakum, Dinakum, 
وَتَمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيْتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا From the last ayat that was sent down upon the Prophet ﷺ from Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, On this day I have perfected for you your religion, and I have completed my favor upon you, and I have chosen Islam as your way of life, as your deen, as your conviction, what you're supposed to believe in your heart and embrace and tie and fasten your heart firmly upon this deen, this way of submission that starts off with the heart, the soul, the mind, and then permeates to one's fingertips, to the body, the salah, okay, the zakah, the hajj, the fasting, naam, the jihad, seeking knowledge, and joining the good, forbidding the evil. The physical actions are a manifestation of what's inside of the soul, what's inside of the heart, what's inside of one's mind. So this is what the word deen means. That which a thing, or the thing which a person submits to, a thing which a person is convinced with, huh, and believes in, and uh, feels confident in. This is a way of life. So therefore, this ayah proves several things. First and foremost, that Islam is perfect, both generally and specifically, as we just said. One may say, how can it be perfect? How can Islam be for everybody in every place? But we're in 2018. It's not, it's not Arabia anymore. We're not riding camels in the desert. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاهِدًا خَيْرًا لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرًا حُمْرَ نَعَمْ If you guide one person, one person was guided through your hands, through your da'wah, that's better for you than red camels. Where is a red camel? What is a red camel? When's the last time you seen a red camel? Nobody drives camels in Canada. Huh? However, the Prophet Sallallahu not like how certain people think narrowly, he's not speaking in a one-track style. He's speaking universally. Anyone who has any time or place or culture or civilization was expensive, what is costly, what is valuable. Guiding one person to the truth by Allah's permission is better than all wealth. That's what's meant. And it isn't restricted just to a camel. It isn't restricted just to a camel. But the Prophet ﷺ, he spoke to a people. He spoke to a people and in time and in place and he addressed them in the language which they understood. This is crucially important with regards to da'wah is to speak to the language, speak to people in a language which they understand. Moving forward, the author says, "What the leader ala mauti sayi salam qalu taala, inna kemayitun wa inna hum mayitun, thumma inna kum yawman qiyamati inda rabbikum taqtasimun." Allah Azza wa Jalla he says, or the author he says, in the proof that Muhammad has passed away and that he died. One may say, why do we even have to mention this as a delil? The, the reason why is because there are certain people, Muslim, or claim to be Muslim, who say that Muhammad did not die. And you can't say that, that Muhammad died. And if you say that, it's disrespect to Muhammad. You've disrespected him by saying that he is dead. Rather, he has abilities that Allah has given him to make him eternal, everlasting. Okay? The proof that Muhammad died... Is the Quran not Ibn Taymiyyah, not Ibn Muhammad, but the Quran? Allah says, Inna kemayitun. He says, Indeed, you will die. Who was Allah speaking to at that time? Innaka, singular. Indeed, you will pass. Wa innahum mayituna, and they will pass. What clearer, how, how clearer would you want the Quran to be? One may say the first address is not to Muhammad, but it's to the people. But it's in the singular tense, in naka, not in nakum. And then it says, wa in nahum, and they will die. Anyone with any common sense is going to understand that the Quran is being addressed to Muhammad. So Allah says that you will die and they will die. And then after that, on the day of judgment, you will all stand in front of your Lord and you will fight and you will argue. You will all stand in front of your Lord. And you will fight and you will argue, i.e. you will debate. Oh Allah, my Lord, our Lord, we did not mislead those people. These people wanted to be misled themselves. Iblis would say, all I did was whisper to you. All I did was call you. The heads would free themselves from their followers. The followers would, free them, would wish to free themselves from the heads. Wahakadha. The zalim, the oppressor, and the mudloom, the oppressed, the killer, and the kilt. Huh? The blood, the oppression, okay, the secrets will be put forth on this day. 
So the Shaykh is mentioning this point to show you that Muhammad Sallallahu was a human being. Despite all of the things that Allah had blessed him with, he still was a human being. And that he, alayhi salatu wasalam, had passed on. And it's no disrespect to say that Muhammad died. He's a human being. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Allah says, Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. Like those who came before him. إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ I'm nothing more than a human being. وَالنَّاسُ إِذَا مَاتُوا يُبْعَثُونَ وَدَلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى وَقَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَاللَّهُ أَنْبَتَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ نَبَأْتَ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجَ He says here, And when the people die, they will be resurrected. I.e., the book al Surah Thalatha is not just dealing with one issue of one's creed or one's practice. Rather, it's considered to be a summarized, yet comprehensive work on Islam in creed and in action, theory and practice. And this is an issue of one's tawheed and one's aqidah. And it's very sad that we hear aqidah and tawheed, aqidah and tawheed, aqidah and tawheed, day and night. When you actually sit down and listen and watch what is actually being said and taught. Is it aqidah and tawheed? Or is it just one aspect of aqidah and tawheed? Or a few pieces, a few issues, and many other things neglected and abandoned. From one's tawheed and aqidah is resurrection. Rather, rather, this was one of the main points that caused Muhammad and Quraysh to fight was resurrection. So how many lectures do you hear about resurrection? Qiyamah, barzakh, grave, death. But you hear this aspect, tawheed, tawheed, tawheed. Aqidah, 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 aqidah. He has aqidah mistakes, he has tawheed mistakes, so on and so on and so forth. So if you want to talk about tawheed and aqidah, then talk about tawheed and aqidah as a whole. And not just one aspect of it. Not just one aspect of it. And the purpose of you believing and practicing and worshiping and being righteous is to protect your soul is to have in the Ta'ala something to look forward to on the day of judgment upon resurrection. That's the whole purpose of Islam. Why can't I drink alcohol? Why can't I have a girlfriend? Why can't I have a boyfriend? Why can't I do this? Why can't I buy this with riba? Because of resurrection that you're going to be brought back to life and you're going to be held responsible for what you did. So one's resurrection, this is going to be the most important aspect of Islam, of Tawheed, of Aqidah, that you have to mention and talk about in your classes and in your khutbas. And this is why, there's no secret, why the Prophet ﷺ would recite certain surahs in the Salah and instructed the companions to recite surah, certain surahs in the Salah. And this is why Juz Amma is full of this one basic concept, and that's the concept of of resurrection. You think it's an accident? All of these different surahs. Al-Takwir, Al-Infitar, Ida Sama'un Shakat. All of these surahs talk about one thing as their main theme, and that's resurrection. That's life in the hereafter, paradise in hell. So it's a very, very sad state. Of many of us in our classes, in our khutbas, our books, and our lectures, we talk about this, we talk about that, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. But how often do we actually talk about the resurrection and being brought back to life and how responsible for your deeds? So the Sheikh, he says, when the people die, they will certainly be resurrected. And a proof upon this is what Allah Azza says, Minha khalaqnakum. Allah says, from the earth we created you. Yani, dirt, mud, clay. And therein we will what? Bring you back. And you will be brought back another time. So Allah talks about creation. Allah talks about you living on earth. Allah talks about you dying and you being brought back to earth. Brought back to existence. Coming back alive after you pass away. Uh, he also says another ayah from Surah Nuh. Wallahu anbataku min al-ardi nabata. Allah certainly created you from the earth. 
He certainly allowed you to sprout forth from the earth. ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا And you'll be brought back therefrom. Now the question is, with regards to the earth, when a person is brought back to life on a day of judgment, will they be brought back to life on earth? Or will it be another place, another location? Whereas it's mentioned that the earth and the sun and all of these things, what will happen to them, what will take place? So how do we understand these verses? That Allah Azawajal will bring us back to earth? Is the earth going to be destroyed? Is the mahshar, the place of staying and resurrection, the actual earth here? That's the issue we won't get into right now. The author then says, وَبَعْدَ الْبَعْثِ مُحَاسَبُونَ وَمَجْزِيُونَ بِعْمَالِهِمْ he says, and after the ba'ath, after resurrection, it's not just you being brought back to life for nothing, for nonsense. There's something else. He says, muhasabun. It's time to be brought up to account. It's time for your tab and for your bills. It's time for your record to be brought forth. Medziyun. It's time to get, it's time to reap what you've sown. If it's good, then it's good. And if it's bad, then... Allah al-Musta'an. وَدَلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسَاءُوا بِمَا عَمِلُوا وَيَجْزِيَ الَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا بِالْحُسْنَى We'll stop here with the entitled regards to this session from the Sharh. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best.